All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 11, Section 2, The Missouri Crisis. So the Missouri Crisis is very important because essentially any discussion about the cause or beginning of the Civil War in a lot of ways starts with Missouri. The problem in Missouri is essentially the same problem that gets the North and South to fight each other in the Civil War. So we might just say of the Missouri Crisis, we will say, you know, the starting point or cause of the Civil War. Now, one important kind of point to make here is that this is happening in 1820. The Civil War doesn't happen until 1860. So there's a good 40 years between these events. Um, but it's really the same issue, and we sort of alluded to it last section, and that is, for the most part, when it comes to the free and slave states, that the northern states are free, the southern states are slave, but the real sort of dispute is when new western states come in, and the question is, well, what will the status of these new states be? Will new states be free or will new states be slave? And this is essentially where the fight between the North and the South uh, happens. The Civil War is about slavery, but not about slavery per se. It's about slavery plus westward expansion. And we'll kind of see how it plays out here in Missouri very, very early on. Uh, once the Missouri crisis is settled, the issue dies down for a couple of decades but then again is revived in the 18, you know, late 1840s and 1850s especially. So Missouri was a, uh, was a territory that was applying for statehood. So we might just say that Missouri is ready to be a state. Uh, again, you know, the requirements for statehood was that once a certain territory had a large enough population, they could apply as a state. The benefit of statehood is that you get to send members to the government, or one of the benefits of statehood is that now you are represented in the federal government. So Missouri will have members in the House of Representatives. They'll also have two senators. And they'll also be able to participate in electing a president via the Electoral College. Put down just a little bit here. So amongst other things, when new states get added, they get to have senators, they get to have members in the House of Representatives, they send them to DC, and they determine again um, what, uh, you know, what the laws are. So it's very important in that respect. Now, Missouri already had a number of slaves living there. Approximately 10,000 slaves existed in Missouri by the time it applied for statehood. This turns out to be a big issue for those advocating for a free state of Missouri, namely those people in the North. Now, the nation had already attempted to compromise in this issue previously. This was done with the Three-Fifths Compromise. If you recall, this was done during the Constitutional Convention. So this is about 1789. And this was answering the question about representation. It said that Three-Fifths of a slave population would count, count towards, we'll just say the census, right? The census. So that meant that those states that had slaves living in them got to have more members of the House of Representatives, because remember the House is based off of population, and also meant that they had more votes in the Electoral College in terms of choosing a president. Uh, this would be something that northern states grow to resent over time, the fact that the South has a disproportionate amount of political power. Um, so that is one thing that is concerning to the nation. Another thing that's concerning is that at this time, there just happens to be an even balance of free and slave states. You might just say even balance of free and slave states. So when the debate came, right, and again, you can think about this in terms of Missouri is going to be a state. Now it's time for everyone to argue whether or not it's going to be free or slave. 
when they were arguing about this, it really had less to do with the morality of slavery and slavery as an institution and had much more to do with political power. The fear was that if Missouri were to enter as a free state, that those members of the House, the Electoral College, and the Senate would vote for the North or with the North when it came to all issues, including slavery, right? We can just think back to the previous chapter about tariffs, you know, something that has to do with the economy. It's not completely divorced from slavery. The fact that slave economies and their relationship to whether they support or uh, are against tariffs are, you know, it's intertwined together. Um, but, you know, a, a free Missouri would vote with most other northern states in favor of tariffs, and a slave Missouri would vote with other southern states uh, in terms of um, you know tariffs and whatever else it may be. So for most people in the Senate at that particular moment, it was more about political power. In the long run, we can definitely see that this was just the beginning of a much larger and longer debate about slavery itself and how it ended up tearing the nation apart. Now, some Northerners, or one Northerner in particular, tried to figure out or create a compromise. This was the um, senator, maybe Congressman Talmadge, from the North. And what he proposed was that Missouri would start off, essentially this is what he proposed, Missouri would start off as a slave state. Again, recall that there are 10,000 slaves living in Missouri. So this is a, a problem for Northerners who want to see Missouri be a free state. He said, allow Missouri to start off as a slave state and eventually become a free state, essentially advocating for a path of gradual emancipation. That was the path that most Northern states took following the American Revolution. The further and further away that you get from 1776, um, the more and more free those Northern states get, the, the you know, less number of slaves that they have there. Uh, Southerners rejected this amendment. Uh, they were staunch supporters of a pro-slavery position, not just advocating it based off whatever merits they did at the time, but even advocating that the institution of slavery itself was a positive good. And this is a term that um, is used by supporters of slavery, essentially stating that slavery is a positive good. And we'll just say this was used by pro-slavery advocates. Right, used by pro-slavery advocates. Somewhat of an infamous saying, right? A positive good. Now, what was interesting about Missouri was that, you know, prior to this, a lot of the divisions within the United States were along political lines. Think Federalists versus Republicans pro-Jacksonians versus anti-Jacksonians, Democrats and Whigs. On Missouri, it was completely split based off sections of the nations. That is, all Northerners, regardless of political party, wanted to see a free state of Missouri, and all Southerners wanted to see, oops, a, uh, a slave state of Missouri. Again, that's what sectional means, split along sectional lines. So there was an intense debate about Missouri. Again, you know, we might just want to uh, put it here at the top so we know what we're, what we're essentially talking about. Essentially, the question is, should slavery be legal in Missouri? Again, you know, at this time, there's really no debate about the existing status of slavery in the nation, at least not on a national level. There is by groups like abolitionists and others. Um, but, you know, the, the legality of slavery in Pennsylvania is not in question. The legality of slavery in Georgia is not in question. The legality of slavery of new states is what becomes in question, essentially. And the nation did find a compromise. And this is what you see in the decades leading up to the Civil War, that although the North and South disagree uh, on a lot of different things, but especially slavery, the nation is able to find sort of a, a midway point, so to speak, to sort of appease people for the time being. But those compromises only last so long. You know, we know this looking back. We know that with the crisis of Missouri, this is just the beginning of a decades-long crisis that eventually leads to the tearing apart of the country, uh, quite literally. 
Um, but at the time, you know, this was sort of a way to kind of, uh, you know, maybe, maybe um, you know, kick the can down the road. That's kind of a good way that I like to put it. Um, the nation didn't want to deal with the harsh and hard reality of the contradiction between slavery and American ideals. And so instead they compromised and they kept kicking the issue down the road until it turned into the bloodiest conflict in all of American history. So what they reached was the Missouri Compromise, which was reached around 1819 to 1820, usually 1820, easier date to remember. And what the compromise did was that it admitted Missouri as a slave state. So in the fundamental question, it was the pro-slavery advocates who won. However, because there were there was much, I would say there was more concerned over political power than in fact the morality of slavery itself, Northerners agreed to this because they also created a new state in Maine that would be a free state. So this balanced political power, right? So it wasn't that all Northerners were happy with this, but enough Northerners were happy with the political power question being answered that they could agree to the slave state of Missouri. So for example, uh, you know, Missouri would send two pro-slavery senators to the Senate. Well, Maine would send two anti-slavery, or in this case, actually, I'm gonna take that back. That's not entirely right. Missouri would send two pro-slavery senators, or at least senators who would vote on behalf of the slave states. Maine would send two representatives that represented Northern interests. So again, those votes would essentially cancel each other out as a result. And again, enough Northerners thought that was good enough, right, for the time being. Uh, the last thing that was created was this compromise line. And this compromise line was to ensure that this problem would never come up again. Essentially, this is a line that determined the legality of slavery in Western states. So, you know, the politicians at the time understood that Missouri would only be, and here we've got a, a map here, we'll just sort of point out where Missouri is. So you can see Missouri right here. Uh, and you can kind of see why there was such debate there anyways, right? Missouri, it's not really a southern state. It's not really a northern state. It's kind of right there on the line. Uh, so whether or not it should be slave or free, you, just from the geography, you can kind of tell why there was a debate there. Um, so that was in red. Uh, that would be a slave state. Of course, Maine, the new free state added up here, right? So political power would be balanced out. But, um, you know, the senators and members of the House of Representatives knew that this would be a problem in the future, that after Missouri, there'd be new states that needed to be added. And, you know, Nebraska, Kansas, actually, I, I really don't like this map because it's not what the country looked like at the time. Uh, you know, these, those states didn't exist yet. But anyways, the point is still the same. And that is this line right here, the compromise line. Essentially, what Northerners said was that, yes, we will agree that Missouri will be a slave state, but it's going to be the most northern newly admitted state because in the future, everything below this line, this compromise line, uh, will be uh, slave, right? That was the agreement. And everything above this line would be free. And so just like that in 1820, the issue of the Civil War popped up in a very intense way there was a compromise, there was a solution, and because of this line, it had seemed like, at least at the time, this issue was resolved. And so then, you know, in American history, you typically proceed through the presidencies of, you know, Andrew Jackson, the conflict between the common class, the elite class, rise of the two-party system, Whigs and the Democrats, the change in Indian policy with Indian removal. And it's really not until the 1840s when there starts to be um, you know, issues particularly pertaining to Texas and the West, that this issue bubbles up again. So the Missouri Compromise put this question of slavery in the Western territories. Uh, let's see. Here it is. Right. 
So the Missouri Compromise put this issue of slavery and westward expansion to rest for about 20 years or so, uh, but the fundamental difference in ideology between the North and the South, not just on this sort of arbitrary uh, use of political power, but on the more fundamental question of slavery itself, that, you know, that gets revived again in the 1840s and 1850s, eventually leading to the Civil War.